In this video, we're going to model, program, and machine these brackets. For the CAD, we're going to use SOLIDWORKS, and for the CAM, we're going to use the HSM plugin in SOLIDWORKS, which was developed by Autodesk. So if you're using Fusion 360, the steps are going to be the same. The machining's done on this converted Precision Matthews PM30MV mill, and it's running a Centroid Acorn control. The chapters in this video are called out in the description, so feel free to skip ahead if any of this doesn't interest you. Today, a friend of mine is in a pinch because he needs some replacement brackets for a piece of furniture. I had to tighten up the design a little to fit it into this 2 by one and a quarter aluminum stock bar. This stock is 2 inches wide, so I made the bracket 1.9 inches tall, just smaller than the stock, and it's 2.5 inches long. It's half an inch thick and needs a clearance slot for a 1 inch bar, so we made it 40 thou oversized. We add some corner chamfers and head to McMaster Car to double check the diameter of a number 8 wood screw for our mounting holes. We pop the first hole in, mirror it, and add one more on the bottom. We add some small corner fillets and finally a chamfer all around the part, and this is it. This is what we want our finished part to look like. For the cam though, I like to remove most of the chamfer features because it lets us select edges more easily. You'll see what I mean in a minute. I like to model the stock material instead of defining it in the cam job. I think it's a little more foolproof, but you don't have to do it this way. The first step in CAM is to create a job. In this part, I've got two bodies, the model, or the part, and the stock we're trying to cut the model out of. When you create a job, you're telling the software which body is the model and which body is the stock. You'll also define the orientation of the stock, which is just explaining to the software how you'll be placing the stock in your vise. Are you going to clamp it long ways, short ways, straight up and down? The software needs to know. Lastly, in the job, we'll define an origin on the part, which is the point where X, Y, and Z are all zero. We choose the top dead center of the stock as our origin, and it's represented by that little blue-green-red triad on the part. If we can do all the machining we need when the part's in this orientation, it's the only job we'll have to create, but if we want to flip the part around in the vise to remove material from the other side, which is what we're going to do in the second operation, we'll need to create another job later that explains to the software how we've changed the orientation of the part. Our machining strategy is going to be to cut out the main rectangular outline, then cut out the slot. So I'm going to make a couple sketches that'll help us define some toolpaths later. First, I'm going to trace this outline that doesn't include the slot. Then, in a separate sketch, I'm going to trace the open contour of the slot only. Alright, let's get started with a 2D adaptive toolpath. The first thing we're asked to define is the tool we want to use, which in our case is going to be a 3 8 3 flute aluminum end mill. Then we confirm the feeds and speeds we want to run. On this little PM30, we'll be running at the maximum 3000 RPM, taking 2.5 thou feed per tooth, which is going to result in a feed rate of 2.5 inches per minute. In the next tab, which is the geometry tab, we have to define the outline we want to cut in that blue model box. So we select that first sketch we made, which is the main rectangular outline of the part, and then we deselect machine cavities, which is just telling the software that we want to machine away the outside of the blue selection, not the inside. The selection box below that is the stock contour selection box. By default, the stock contour obeyed by the 2D adaptive toolpath is the literal contour, or outline, of the stock that we defined in the job. This just means that by default, if you don't select anything from the stock contour in a 2D adaptive clearing operation, the program will assume that you want to cut whatever geometry you selected out of the stock that we defined in the job. If this is confusing, it won't be in a minute, so let's keep going. Next is the Heights tab. This is where we tell the program about how deep we want to machine. By default, the program is going to machine as deep as the contour we selected in the Geometry tab. But you can override it here if you want, which is nice, because it doesn't really matter what Z height our selected contour is at. Our selection happens to be at the bottom surface of the part, but if it was at the top, we could do the following steps and get the exact same result. In this case, we want to machine 50 thousandths deeper than the bottom surface of the part to give ourselves some clearance when we flip it around in the vise to machine material away from the bottom. So in the bottom section, I select from selection in the dropdown, select the bottom surface of our part, and then enter minus 50 thousandths in the dialog box. If you look closely, I missed the negative sign and you'll see the consequences of that in a minute. Next is the Passes tab. This is where we tell the program about the width and depth of cut we'd like to take. I want to take an 80 thou width of cut, but I don't want to machine that at full depth. I want to machine it in two layers, because my machine isn't really rigid enough to do it in one shot at this 80 thou step over. So we check the multiple depths box and enter 0.3 inches as the maximum step down. And let's check the use even step down box to, well, make sure the step downs are even. If we don't check the use even step downs box, the program's going to machine to a depth of 0.3 inches first, and then machine whatever's left, which is going to be less than 0.3, and the step downs won't be even. The 2D adaptive toolpath is a roughing operation, so by default, the stock to leave boxes down here are both 20 thousandths, meaning it's going to leave 20 thousandths of material on all the sidewalls and all the floors, which we then come back and clean up with a finishing toolpath that'll leave a nicer surface. I'm going to leave a 10 thousandths skin on the sidewalls, but nothing on the floors since we're machining past the bottom anyway. When we accept the toolpath, we get to see a preview, and it looks good. It looks like we're going to machine only the main rectangular profile in two layers like we intended. 
Let's make another 2D adaptive toolpath to cut out the slot. In both Fusion 360 and this HSM cam I'm using, we don't have to reselect our tool and our feeds and speeds in the tools tab. We can change them, but by default they carry over from the last operation, and we're going to keep these the same. In the next geometry tab though is where things get interesting. We select the slot sketch as the geometry we want to machine, but this time we select the first sketch we created as the stock contour. We don't want to use the default stock contour, which is the outline of the stock we defined in the job, because we've already machined that material away. The only material remaining at the start of this machining operation is that main rectangular shape, so that's what we want to select as our stock. Here's what the toolpath looks like when we select the main rectangle as the stock contour, and here's what it looks like when we select nothing. Look at the difference. When the software thinks we're machining the slot contour from the original stock, it adds these extra cuts we'd need to work our way in from the outside of the original stock. But when we select the main rectangular sketch for the stock contour, the software knows there's no longer material around it, so it starts machining in the right spot without cutting air. Let's run a stock simulation and see what we've got. Well, this isn't exactly what we wanted to end up with. Look at the misalignment between those blue and green floors. This is where I noticed I missed the minus sign in front of the 50 thou dimension in the heights tab of the first 2D adaptive clearing operation. Let's go back and fix it. We left that 10 thou skin all around the sides of the part, so let's clean it up with a 2D contour. Our tool and feeds and speeds carry over from the last operation, and we'll keep those the same. So we go to the geometry tab and select the perimeter of the part that we're trying to clean up. The 2D contour is an easier one. The tool just sort of follows the edge you select on the side that you specify. We go over to the Heights tab and change the Bottoms dropdown to From Selection. We select the bottom of the part, and this time we're only going to go 40 thou past the bottom surface of the part, not 50. It'll still give us enough clearance to cleanly remove material when we flip it in the vise from the other side, and when we're doing this operation, the end will won't be dragging on the floor of the part when we're trying to get the best possible finish. This is kind of my own theory, and I'm not really sure if it makes a difference. If any real machinists are watching, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. There's one more option in the Passes tab I like to change. It's the Finishing Overlap. This is just the distance that the tool moves past the starting point to get a cleaner finish. With a tool this size, I like to set it to about 50 thou. We accept the toolpath and can take a look at it. It looks good. It goes all the way around the part, and this is our 50 thou finishing overlap. When we select all the toolpaths up to this point, we can see that the 2D contour finishing path doesn't go quite as deep as the adaptive paths, which is what we asked for. Alright, so now for the easy stuff. Let's put the holes in. We're going to spot drill the holes with a 90 degree chamfer tool, then drill them. You should be spotting the holes with a tool that has an angle as wide or wider than the drill, which in my case is about 120 degrees, but for softer materials like aluminum and plastics, I find it doesn't really matter and this works just fine. We select the three holes, drill 50 thou past the model top, add another drilling operation with the actual drill and do the same thing but this time go a little past the bottom of the part. Then we face the part off with the Tormox Superfly and break the sharp corner edge with the chamfer tool. We just used the chamfer tool to spot the holes though before changing to the drill, so now we're creating a toolpath that's going to ask us to change the tool back to the chamfer mill. But we can drag the chamfering operation up in the tree to take place when the chamfer tool was last loaded. The first toolpath to run is going to be the top path, then the second, third, and so on. So it's a good idea to group these operations by tool. Here we're going to run all the toolpaths that use the 3 8 end mill first, then all the toolpaths that use the chamfer mill, then the drill, then the superfly. Doing this is going to save us some tool changes, which is extra important for me because I don't have an automatic tool changer. Let's do one more stock simulation to make sure we're on the right track, and everything looks good. Our stock is 2 and 5 eighths long, so let's set it up in the saw and bring it to size. These are all the tools we need to run the CAM program we just made. Before we can use them though, we have to make sure the CNC controller knows how much each tool is sticking out of the tool holder. In the CNC world, this is called the tool offset. We pick a reference surface with the probe, and in the control we can set the tool offset for each tool with respect to this reference surface to let the software know where exactly the tool tip is. Next, we put the stock in the vise in the same orientation we defined in the job, and show the control where we define the origin by using probing routines to find the top dead center of the part. The point that the probe is touching now is the origin which we defined in CAM, so now the control knows where our part is in space, and where in space it should run the toolpaths we just created. So we're ready to start machining. Let's turn our toolpaths into G-code for the control by posting the code. Then we load the code into the controller and hit cycle start. This is where the machine's going to go through all the machining operations we programmed in CAM. We start by cutting out the main rectangle shape with the three flutes aluminum end mill, so that's what the controller is going to ask us to load up first. Watch the way the tool enters the stock. It's at the bottom right corner, just like it does in CAM. Then it cuts out the shape a layer deeper and moves on to the next toolpath. This is where we start cutting out the slot in the same way, taking 80,000 stepovers to clear the first layer, then we run that same toolpath one layer deeper. 
When that's done, the 2D contour cleans up the walls by removing that 10 thou skin. Next, the control asks us to load up the chamfer tool, and after pressing cycle start, it'll spot the holes and chamfer the edges. When that's done, we load up the drill to put in the holes, and the superfly to face the part. Here we're putting in the countersinks for the wood screws. I wasn't sure how deep to drill them, so I didn't film this part in cam, but I'm just repeatedly spot drilling deeper and deeper here until I find the depth that'll give us the perfect countersink. Then I program the original spot drilling operation to go down to this depth, so for the next copy we make, we'll have these countersinks in before we drill the holes. The truth is, I usually hack my way through the first part, making improvements along the way. Then by the time we're machining the second copy of the part, the program's perfect and it just takes a beer and some tool changes in the garage. And so once you've nailed the program down, you can make as many of the copies as you want, if you've got enough beer. So let's keep hacking our way through the first part. We've got one side done, but now we have to remove all the material from the other side. This facing operation at multiple depths takes all the stock material off the bottom. I'm the first to admit that learning cam can feel a little like drinking from a fire hose. There's all these tabs and values we have to define just right to get what we want. But for 90% of the parts I make, this is all I had to learn. Look at this part. If it looks complicated to machine, it isn't. The number of toolpaths might look intimidating, but look closely at the toolpaths in this job. They're all just either 2D adaptive or 2D contour operations. Okay, with a little bit of drilling and chamfering sprinkled in, but all of which we just used to make this part. So all I did was apply what we just went through to this part over and over until every feature was machined, which definitely took more tool paths, but nothing more complicated. When I was first learning CAM, which was not very long ago, I was most intimidated by all the options of tool paths to choose from. How would I ever know which one to use? Do I really have to figure out how to use all these different tool paths? And well, I found the answer is no. Other than the easy ones like facing, drilling, and chamfering, and okay, sometimes threading a hole, I almost exclusively only use the 2D adaptive and 2D contour toolpaths to make parts. Playing around with the other toolpaths is a lot of fun, and you can make some really cool shapes. If you're interested in playing around with them, watch this video from Rob Lockwood on how they work. He's a real expert on how all this cam stuff works, and is amazingly good at making it simple. But if you're like me and mostly need to make parts with flat floors and vertical walls, the 2D adaptive and 2D contour toolpaths are kind of all you need. Now by now some of you might have noticed that we could have just selected the perimeter of this part and had one 2D adaptive clearing operation cut out both the main shape and the slot at the same time. And that's true. It would have been the way I'd made this part if I wasn't making this video. But I wanted to show how we can have complete control of the 2D adaptive toolpath by using stock contours. There's going to be times when you want to limit your toolpath to a very specific area, like if there's a fixture in the way or when an area has already been machined in a previous operation, which is kind of what we simulated by splitting our machining operations into the main outline and then cutting the slot. It's an easy concept to understand, but trying to explain to the software exactly which area of the part I wanted to machine and which area I didn't is something that used to really mess with me. And once I wrapped my head around how to do it, I kind of had an aha moment and it gave me the confidence to machine more intricate parts or parts with, you know, work holding or fixturing in the way that I couldn't always machine in one shot. Like this knife. Look at all the clamps at the top of the part. I had to cut the bottom of the knife out first, then when I flipped the clamps at the bottom of the knife, I could machine the top, but there's no way I could have done this in one operation. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video.